we are really, you know, stuck and there's no fuel. New York, September 11th, 2018. High up in the skies, Air India 101 is approaching John F. Kennedy International Airport for a second attempt to land. This plane has just suffered multiple sensitive instrument failures. After a 14-hour flight, they are running low on fuel. They've also lost the ILS, the device that helps the pilots land the plane, especially in poor weather. Outside the cockpit, it's raining heavily. With clouds all around them, the pilots are flying blind, and it's next to impossible to spot the runway. With every passing minute, they are using up more fuel, and they have to land now. The lives of 357 people on board now depends on what the pilots do in the next few minutes. Were they able to avoid another tragedy on September 11th in New York? Let's find out. This is the story of Air India Flight 101. It's a warm autumn night in New Delhi's Indira Gandhi International Airport. 342 passengers and 15 crew were preparing for their 14 hour long flight to New York. The US is a popular destination for Indian students and tourists. And the plane was at maximum capacity. This flight from Delhi's IGI to New York's JFK is Air India's flagship route. This flight would take the passengers over the polar route, flying over the rugged terrain of Pakistan, Russia, Finland, Greenland, and Canada before entering the USA. The plane for today's flight was a Boeing 777-300 extended range twin jet. It's fitted with two GE90-115B engines. This plane was first delivered to Air India in 2009 and it has been in operation for over nine years. The 777 can be flown by two pilots. But because this flight was 15 hours long and needed to cover around 12,000 kilometers, AI-101 had four pilots. Two served as the main crew and the other two as the relief crew. The commander was Captain Rustam Palia, a 49-year-old with 3,500 hours on the type. With him in the cockpit were Captain Vikas, Captain Shushant Singh and Captain D.S. Bhatti. It's the first time the four of them were flying together. During the pre-flight briefing, the engineering staff reported that the flight's auxiliary power unit, the APU, was not functioning. The APU on an aircraft like the Boeing 777ER is not typically considered critical for the safe operation of the aircraft. While the APU provides auxiliary power for various aircraft systems when the main engines are not running, it is not a primary propulsion system. Hence, the pilots agreed that this issue was non-critical and elected to proceed with their flight to New York. With the possibility of inclement weather in the forecast, the captain opted to onload an additional 800 kilos of fuel to take them to an alternate airport if required. This decision would end up being crucial. The crew then asked for pushback and taxi clearance, and the plane then departed Delhi at 0300 local time, delayed by around one hour. The departure itself was uneventful. The first signs of problems occurred 40 minutes into the flight. Whilst over Pakistani airspace, and just after reaching 30,000 feet, a warning message appeared on the pilot screen saying, single source radio altimeter. A radio altimeter is like a magic ruler for airplanes that tells them how high they are above the ground. It does this by sending invisible waves down to the ground and timing how long it takes for them to come back. This helps pilots land safely and fly at the right altitude. The Boeing 777, like many modern commercial aircraft, includes three radio altimeters for redundancy and safety. They do it so that if one radio altimeter fails, the aircraft can rely on the other two altimeters to provide accurate altitude information. But what this plane was telling the pilots was that two radio altimeters had failed and only one 
was working. The problem was, how can you be sure that the one altimeter that is working is actually showing the correct height? Now, this isn't an issue in cruise flight because during cruise, a different type of altimeter called the barometric altimeter is used. The barometric altimeter uses the air pressure to determine how high they are above sea level. It operates based on the principle that atmospheric pressure decreases with increasing altitude. But this is less accurate than the radio altimeter. Radio altimeter becomes very important when accurate height informations are critical, like during departure and more importantly, during landing. Keep this in mind for now. We'll come back to it soon. Fast forward 10 hours and the flight is now flying across the Atlantic Ocean. And this is where the second issue appeared. There was another three hours to go before it was time to land in New York. The pilots got a warning that their TCAS system was not working. TCAS, the Traffic Collision Avoidance System, is like a smart traffic cop for airplanes. It uses radar to see other planes in the sky. And if two planes got too close, traffic. it tells traffic. the pilots of each Climb. of the planes Climb to either down. go up or go down to avoid a collision. Clear of conflict. It helps keep the sky safe by preventing planes from bumping into each other. The loss of the TCAS itself was again not a major concern because during cruise, it was a backup system to prevent collisions. However, it's a handy wingman during takeoff and landing when you're usually flying in a crowded airspace and your workload is very high. Now this started to concern the crew because it's usually uncommon for unrelated instruments to stop working. The APU was not working prior to takeoff, the radio altimeters failed just after takeoff, and now the TCAS had also failed. What they were concerned was whether there was an unknown issue with the plane that was causing all these failures to happen. But there was nothing much they could do now, so they pushed on to New York. It's now around 10 minutes past 6 in the morning in New York. The weather was overcast with rain and clouds. The METAR indicated a visibility of quarter statute mile for runway 04 right and a vertical visibility of 200 feet. AI-101 entered the New York airspace and made contact with the approach controller. Uh, good morning, Air India 101, uh, final 4 right. Air India 101, having Kennedy Tower, good morning, you're following an Embraer short final, wind 040 at 4, RVR 3000, runway 4 right, clear to land. 4 right, clear to land, Air India 101. After obtaining their approach clearance for runway 4 right at JFK, the pilots attempted to use their ILS to capture the localizer and the glide slope to guide them towards the runway. However, try as they may, the ILS just wasn't capturing the localizer signals. Their instrument landing system had also failed. The ILS is super helpful for planes when they are landing. It uses special radio signals and antennas on the runway to guide the plane down safely, showing the pilots where to go and how high they are. It's like following invisible lines in the sky to make sure the plane lands smoothly, especially in bad weather. This is also the device that enables the plane to auto land. In this plane, the ILS wasn't locking onto the signals being sent from the runway. The crew then manually pointed the plane at the correct heading and then tried what's called a LNAV VNAV approach. LNAV VNAV approach uses GPS similar to what you have in your cars, to take the airplane close to the runway. However, unlike the ILS, the LNAV VNAV isn't precise and has a lateral precision of 0.3 nautical miles. Hence, the pilots need to be able to visually see the runway at their decision altitude before they land. If they aren't able to see the runway at their minimas, they'll need to go around and try again. As they were closing towards the runway, the pilots extended the landing gear and immediately another warning sound started to go off in the cockpit. This warning was telling the pilots that the landing gear was not fully down and that immediate action needed to be taken. Upon hearing this sound, 
the pilots are trained to act instinctively to check and solve the issue. And then after going through the checklist, found that the gear was indeed down and that it was a false alarm. For the pilots who were already experiencing heavy workload, this was a significant distraction. At this point in time, the plane was covering three to four miles a minute. With all the instrument failures and the incorrect gear warnings, the pilots weren't able to stabilize the aircraft for landing and hence decided to go around and try again. Star Air India 171 going around uh, runway 4 right. Air India 171 heavy, roger, fly runway heading, climb and maintain 2000. Runway heading 2000, Air India 171. The aircraft climbed back to 2000 feet and the pilots then got in touch with New York's departure controller. Air India 171 heavy, climb runway 4 right, maintaining uh, 2000 heading uh, 100. Air India 101 heavy, thank you, right of contact, and right heading 180, altimeter 3011. The crew then informed the ATC that they required longer holding vectors to try to solve the problems that they were having and that they were not ready for a second attempt to land just yet. And, uh, uh, Rina, Air India 101, uh, could we have uh, longer vectors? We were facing some uh, instrument uh, problems as well. Was that the reason for the go around? Uh, AFIRM. AFIRM because uh, we lost the uh, localizer and our minima changed and uh, there were a lot of issues involved. So we're trying to sort that out uh, if we can even continue with this approach. Now to understand what happens next, you'll need to understand what a cloud ceiling is. A cloud ceiling is the height at which the lowest part of the clouds are above the ground. It tells the pilots at what height above the ground can they start seeing the ground. If the plane had a working ILS, and the ability to auto land, the pilots can land the plane at a cloud ceiling of zero feet. However, since these pilots were doing a non-precision approach, they need to visually see the runway to ensure that they are landing at the right place. And for that, they required a minimum ceiling of 600 feet. JFK airport had a ceiling of 200 feet. Their alternate airports of Newark and Stewart we're also at 200 feet. Okay, well right now the weather that I have is showing um, indefinite ceiling 200 at Kennedy. Uh, RVR is uh, 4,500, so that's gotten a little bit better. The visibility is fine, but the problem we are facing is with uh, the ceiling because uh, we can't continue with the ILS uh, with a ceiling of uh, 200 because every time we try to lock on to uh, the uh, localizer, uh, you know, the instrumentation does, does, doesn't allow us to do that. Okay, okay so you, can't, you cannot do like an auto land or something? Uh, no, auto land is not available because both, uh, uh, we've got two radio altimeter failures. So we're on uh, one radio altimeter, we've got uh, TCAS failures, we've got all multiple uh, uh, instrument uh, failures. So what ceiling do you need? You know, anything about uh, like 600 or so. Okay, I got it. Okay, I understand now. Just uh, fly heading 220, let me find some weather, pull some weather up and let me find something. Okay, thanks. The other issue that the pilots were having was that they wanted to conserve any remaining fuel to allow them to carry out multiple go-arounds if they so had to do them. This meant that they had to land at an airport near the New York area and couldn't fly further out to Boston or Washington to land there. And um, just be, uh, before I, I, I go away, uh, what was your potential alternate? Uh, the primary alternate was uh, Newark, and uh, the secondary alternate is uh, Stewart, but both seem to be uh, you know, in the same sort of situation. They were depleting their fuel and were beginning to use their reserves. The additional 800 kilos that they had loaded in Delhi was now proving to be helpful. Air India 101 Heavy, I'm having trouble finding anything that's really that good. I have Albany is 600 feet overcast and Boston, Logan would be uh, 500 overcast. Um, um, is, uh, what, what I'm trying to find da uh, Washington, Dulles is, uh, is at 200 feet also. We're just checking uh, Boston as well because we're getting uh, a little low on the fuel as well. So we need to decide quick. And uh, we're burning quite a lot in the sun. If you're higher, we can burn a little less fuel. And then uh, I believe Pittsburgh is 2,500. Uh, 2,500, uh, that's uh, 
We have just checked for the fuel as far as this goes. Aaron, do you want to one two one zero one heavy? Climb maintain uh, six thousand. Climb maintain six thousand. Tell it to one zero one. Aaron, do you want to one heavy? I think based on on the weather that we have in the area and based on the forecast that I'm seeing, I think Bradley Bravo Kilo Bravo Delta Lima will be your, your best option. Ah, uh, okay. And uh, what's the feeling there? Okay, right now the ceiling at uh, there is 500 overcast. Got a trend showing it's uh, the ceiling at, at uh, JSK is also improving a bit. I could try a VNAV uh, approach. Okay, and see, you know, it, it, it can take us down in a situation like this because we're really, you know, stuck and there's no fuel. And I'm showing Newark just had a special, and they're, and they're showing 400 overcast. They, they just had a special at uh, 1205 Zulu, so about six minutes ago. Okay, so it's a bit uh, better now in uh, Newark, is that correct? Yes, yeah, sir. The, the, the weather came up to 400 feet overcast at Newark. The departure controller then told the pilots of a new special METAR that was released by Newark that showed that the ceiling had lifted to 400 feet. The pilots decided to attempt to land at Newark with a 400 feet ceiling. Remember, this is still lower than the 600 feet that they'd initially wanted. So they were still not out of the woods. Okay, so you want to do the VNAV approach into Newark, is that correct? Uh, that's right, that's the only option that we have because, uh, uh, you know, the ILS is unpredictable because every time we uh, turn towards the localizer, it's, uh, it's just gone. Okay, so your ILS is out of service on both, both sides of the airplane, right? Yeah, uh, that's correct. And then the, uh, you said also the radar altimeters are out on both sides of the airplane? Uh, that's right, we are on a single radio altimeter now. At this point, the plane had just around 7,200 kilograms of fuel left. Just enough to complete the trip. Aaron, do you want to Other than both ILSs, both radar altimeters, what other things have failed on the airplane? Single source uh, radio altimeter. We've got TCAS failure, no auto land, uh, wind shield system, uh, auto speed brake, and the uh, and our APU is unserviceable as well. And in a grim reminder to the pilots of how precarious their position was, the controller asked them. Aaron, do you want to so just when you get a chance, give me the people on board and the fuel on board, please. Uh, we have total of 370 and uh, fuel uh, uh, 7200 uh, kg. The pilots were then handed off to the Newark approach controller, who cleared them for the full right approach. 2101 heavy, 210 miles from doing, turn right heading 010, meet me three times. That's all stuff, the localizer is cleared, I watch runway 4 right approach. The controller then scrambled the emergency vehicles in case assistance was required once the plane landed. Security 101 Heavy, emergency personnel will be standing by. Security 201. one, while we wait here, uh, nature of emergency is a uh, computer failure. Aircraft type is a uh, Boeing 777 uh, whiskey model. 270 souls on board and 72,000 Fuel. Now at this time, the crew had been flying for over 14 hours in a high-stress environment, trying to land a massive fully loaded airplane in one of the busiest air corridors in the world without all their usual instruments. And to add to that, when they saw outside the cockpit, all they saw was clouds. And with each passing minute, the pilots were hoping that the clouds would lift and that they would see the runway below. As the plane kept descending and when it passed 1,000 feet, the plane was higher than what their ideal descent path required. And if this wasn't immediately corrected, the plane would have to go around a second time and use more fuel, which they didn't have. Captain Palia corrected this by pushing the plane's nose down to get back to the ideal path. But this caused the plane to speed up further. And at one point, the controller saw a warning on their screen indicating that the plane was too low to the ground and then relayed that to the pilots. And at 400 feet, they finally broke through the clouds. And at that point, they saw that they were too high and further right of where they needed to be. 
Captain Palia corrected the flight by pushing the nose down and to the left to get the plane to line up with the center line. And finally, after 15 hours of flying, the plane landed safely on runway 4 right at Newark. Emergency services then got in touch with the pilots to ask them whether they required any assistance. But the pilots declined. Ten minutes after they landed, as they were taxiing to the gate, the entire airport was engulfed by a thunderstorm. If the crew had delayed their approach by five minutes or had to make a second go-around, they would never have been able to land. Unfortunately, the root cause of these numerous instrument failures remains unknown, as neither an incident report nor an investigation report has been released by Air India. However, a prevailing hypothesis suggests that the aircraft's main computer, which controls the flight tech, the diagnostic systems and maintenance systems, malfunctioned, presenting inaccurate values to the pilots. Despite being a crew of four individuals, who had not previously collaborated, the pilots demonstrated commendable crew resource management by effectively coordinating with each other and with air traffic control, ultimately ensuring a safe landing of the plane. The plane was flown back to India the next day as a ferry flight for relocation. 